Hello again and welcome to the Gospel of Luke. I'm Jim Grant again with my two good friends sharing with you the treasures of this Gospel which we are reading during this year C in the Catholic lectionary. Uh, Robert Maldonado, professor of philosophy at California State University for the past 22 years, and with him Father Mike Listeri, who is the Director of Worship for the Diocese of Fresno and Pastor of Immaculate Heart of Mary Parish in Hanford, California. Back again. I wonder if uh, Robert could make that little bridge with one item we covered last week, but maybe didn't get to make um, a full statement about that woman bent over. Well, it's important, I think, to remember that Luke does have a particularly uh, interesting focus on women characters and women who have important functions in, in his gospel. And, and we talked about last week the flourishing of, of people and, and how Luke matches the woman with the man with dropsy. And, and I always think it's important that, that she was bent over and, and that the traditions and, and doctors and, and social and political issues are keeping her from standing up straight and, and actually looking up to God. And, and so I think it's just important that we don't contribute to that and keep women bent. And that would be our goal as church, as community of faith, and hopefully Luke telling that message to his own community speaks to us today equally, if not more so. On that note, uh, the Christian Great Supper. Father Michael, could you um, share with us the treasures of chapter 14, verses 15 to 24? What's going on in this Great Supper? Well, the Great Supper is another one of those stories, again, dining and eating and uh, people gathering, but there's a great disappointment because many are invited, few are, uh, if you are responding to it. Again, I invite people to, to allow humor to be a part of this, in a sense, because here is a man gives a great banquet, he invites many people, and yet... Uh, the excuses they come up with that they can't come. One says, I bought five oxen and I need to examine them. Uh, there's the five oxen. There, there you go. And so that, that's going to keep them away from a party. Another one says, I've married a woman and I can't come. There you go. And you think, well, that just, uh, okay, that's quite a, an excuse. And uh, so all of these things come up, and of course, the man has been generous, generous enough to invite all these folks. He has thrown a great banquet, he has spared no expense, and they just flatly say no. In the sense that God, and again, through the discipleship, it's that sense of, you know, uh, God has spared nothing. He has given everything, and, and Jesus uh, in that example there wants everybody to share in what he has to offer but there will be those who just will always come up with a flimsy excuse and then again as we mentioned in the show last week of another banker do the same thing the man goes out and says go out to the highways and the byways and invite everyone invite them all invite them all and bring them in and uh, and therefore again repeating you know what we said looking at, at the world around us and that is the great message of Jesus both in the gospel and certainly as I mentioned last week in the the message of Pope Francis again that it's not for us to stay complacent but rather we go beyond the door because there are many within the door within the walls who do not listen who have become complacent and then have turned others off to faith and a real lively faith it's a real if you will challenge certainly for the listener here um, this parable, this story that would invoke, there's some, you know, there's humor, but there's a real biting um, result of it too. Robert, before sharing with us the cost of discipleship, which is yours to do next, anything left here that Father Mike uh, didn't quite uncover yet? Well, I just want to point out how bizarre this passage actually <laughs> <laughs> seems to me. Uh, I don't know quite what to make of it because in the previous passage, as Father Mike mentioned, the instruction was not to invite the privileged but to invite the poor. And here the man is inviting the privileged, the owners of ox, uh, able to not participate for getting married. I mean the poor would continue to have to work. And, and, and then he gets angry when they uh, don't treat him properly relative to his yeah. station. And then when his slave, it says servant, but the word is slave, uh, when his slave uh, does 
and then says there's still room, he says go and compel people to come in. And that word is almost exclusively used throughout the scripture when uh, Jews are being forced to do religious things that they are not wanting oh to do. <laughs> and, and of course, you take it out of that context, you know, it's, it's legitimated, you know, all sorts of terrible things, forcing people uh, into Christianity or whatever in, in mission. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of baffled by this, <laughs> by this passage because the man seems to be doing in the initial uh, parable exactly what he's not supposed to be doing according to the previous teaching. And then, and that would still make sense because it could still be kind of a negative example, but then the very last line, I think Luke is trying to push it into some kind of application uh, that, uh, not that we're compelling these people to come in so that they come in, it's just that there will be nothing left for these people who have declined the initial uh, invitation, but it's, it's weird. Now, if that weren't that weird enough, time, but <laughs> uh, which, which, which it sort of is, especially when you put it in context, as Father Mike did, about how many lame excuses can we come up with? Like, uh, and who can come up with those excuses? As Robert said, only people of means. So it is very involved beyond the simple fact that certain people rejected the invite. Now, Robert, what's your task, which is really a challenge, what we read on the 23rd Sunday of year C and Father Mike preaches on, the cost of discipleship, it's radical in Luke. Tell us a little bit about um, this passage any way you'd like. Well, this passage has the famous, uh, anyone who comes after me and does not hate uh, father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters uh, cannot follow me. And it's, it is a strong uh, verb, uh, though there may be some uh, depending on how you get this maybe back to Aramaic or some other Canaanite Semitic dialect, uh, it could just be a way of saying more, does not love me more, or does not uh, attach to me more. Uh, but it's still quite strong. And the emphasis finally comes down on both the, you know, the commitment and being sure that the commitment is connected to evaluating the costs. If you're not willing to go with the cost of discipleship, you shouldn't even bother. Uh, and if you do, then you should own up to that and uh, accept the cost of renouncing, renouncing prior commitments for the, king, for the new kingdom. Something that's in the passage that we have some images for, uh, I wonder if you'll unpack them for us. For which one of you design or build a tower? So we have a little image of this idea of what are you going to do? If you're going to build a tower, aren't you going to think this out, Jim? Or what king going to battle? It's like there's like a strategy here. And so what is, is Luke trying to energize this community to figure out this is not a cakewalk. It's sort of like a, a pilgrimage. It's a serious journey. And you better have your ducks in line. And then the last thought is that salt you know, it's a good thing, but if it's not got its, its flavor, it is useless. Now, how do all those images in some way become on one page? The tower, the army, the salt, what's all this about the cost of discipleship? Well, I think, again, I think it, we have to remember Luke is predominantly speaking to people of privilege, and, and he is formulating a, a concept of the reign of God that is not Roman patronage and, and all of the sort of perks and privileges that come with being a powerful person in the Roman Empire uh, is nothing. But Luke is trying to uh, bring that message that the kingdom of God is an alternative social, religious, institutional space that's not like the way the world does it. As Monty Python would say, and now for something completely different. In other words, this is a proposal to something alternative to what would be what would be known and either for some people very comfortable or for some people very oppressive. On that note, I think we're going to take our break because we have just finished chapter 14 and what we're going to do when we come back is walk you through 
chapter 15, three parables that actually will in some way illustrate or help us understand, comprehend, and appreciate what is this reign of God? What is this alternative vision? How is it fleshed out in three of Jesus' beautiful parables? The lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. KNXC thanks all its loyal viewers and respected businesses who have supported your Catholic television station. Now you can support KNXT with program underwriting by having your name, your company's name, or organization associated with your favorite program. Detailed information about you or your company will appear before and after each program or day part you select. Keep the quality and spiritual message alive and make a difference. Call 559-488-7440 today or go online at knxt.tv to find out more about program underwriting on KNXT. I mean, it'll... Hello again and welcome to the second part of our 16th program on the Gospel of Luke. We're actually at chapter 15, verse 1. Three parables. They are powerful, they are beautiful, they are simple, but they are profound. And I think Robert Maldonado will walk us through the first two, the lost sheep and the lost coin. Where would you like to go, Robert? Well, I think I'll read it, but just, just again, Luke is pairing uh, a man and a woman in terms of the function in, the, in these two parables. Uh, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, and the Pharisees and the scribes murmured. And again, that could include the sort of the excluded people uh, and then the, the presumed leadership. This man receives sinners and eats with them, which of course is ironic. Uh, it's exactly what he does. So he told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls to his, together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me for I have found the coin which I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So these two, Robert, how would you like to help us see them together or apart? Well, I think it's, it's interesting. Obviously, there's kind of three lost things, the sheep, the coin, and then the son in the next parable. But I, I actually think the focus of all three of the parables, even though that links them together, is a little bit more on the, the shepherd, the woman, and the father than it is on the sort of found elements of the stories. And so again, Luke pairs the man and the woman in these, and these are explicitly about finding lost sinners. And so clearly Luke is, seems to me to be advocating that both men and women are involved in the evangelizing ministry, diligently seeking, doing the work of the, of the kingdom of God. Uh, and, and I think that's the primary motif for Luke is that that leadership of the church needs to be diligent in its search for the sinners and not again get caught up in the forest for the trees, trees for the forest, and uh, uh, privilege and, and expectation that comes because I'm the leader or whatever the issue is. Father Mike, every third year you have the privilege to preach this on the 24th Sunday of the year C and often at other times. These are parables we use all the time. Uh, where do you go with this? Well, again, repeating uh, what uh, Robert has said, it does have more about to do with the shepherd, the woman, and the father. And in, in the case of the shepherd and, and the woman, as was mentioned before, these are people who are limited in what they have. So if Luke is speaking about those who have a limited amount of resources, one has a hundred sheep, that's all. The other has 10 silver coins. Losing one means everything because you don't have a whole lot. I mean, it's already a precious uh, supply. So therefore, um, people struggle in life and how important it is for them to leave the 99 behind to look for the one. Why? Because it's the, they need it. 
the woman who loses that one coin, she needs it for livelihood. It's like that woman who had very little or nothing and then left at the temple tax. So the whole idea is how do people respond of limited of means and how should people of means respond to a poor shepherd or to a poor woman? And again, the father, now the father is of means, and we'll come into that in the next one, but he lost the most precious gift he had. So no matter what he had. So I think, I think there's a lot to be said about the, the characters and where they are in society and how Luke wants to approach that with the background of some of these folks have real challenges in their life. And you can afford to leave 99 sheep behind. Mind. Being the son of a sheep herder, I know. And uh, so therefore, how uh, you do everything to find that one. And so I think that's real important. Two things I'd like to say before we move on to the juicy uh, prodigal son story. Um, the motif I see in all three is, is the word joy, because it's, um, it's very integral and it's, very, uh, re it's repeated very beautifully. Just so I tell you there will be more joy in heaven verse 7, about the um, sheep. Rejoice with me, for I have um, found the coin. So I tell you, there will be joy before the angels of God. Coin. And then the parable that we're going to look at next is the father telling the elder son, you should make merry because your brother who was dead is alive. He who was lost has been found. Joy is the motif. Luke is crazy about joy. It's all over his gospel. The other thing, bringing up my favorite pope right now is Pope Francis. He has a twist on this parable of the, um, the lost sheep. And, and what he makes the point, which Father Mike already made last program, sometimes you've got to leave the one to go get the 99. Because what his goal, as he says, is to get out of the... Uh, to go to the periphery, to go out, to burst through the easy convention and find the bigger fish, get the bigger catch, which is the people who are not in. We've got to almost let go of the in to reach out to those that are out, which is partly a Lucan motif. We must be inclusive in our communities. We must be universal if we're going to be Catholic. On that note, Robert, I think what we want to do is moved to the prodigal son, lost son, prodigal father story. Can you uh, walk us through that? We've got some pictures. Walk us through that beautiful story. Well, the way I would do that is to remind of this kind of critique of privilege that, that Luke is doing here. And, and it's very easy to try to allegorize this story, and then it kind of falls apart because it's very actually difficult to actually accomplish it. Uh, but it's interesting to me that the, the younger son, there's the father the, and the two sons, the younger son wants his inheritance, which means that from the younger son's perspective, his father is dead <laughs> because that's when you would normally get the, and he may get nothing actually with, with the, the older son getting the, the better portion. Uh, but he wants his, his now. And, and from a sort of patriarchal privileged position of the father, if the father was sort of a good Roman uh, father, this would be an extremely shameful thing to let his son get away with this. Uh, what he would rather do is to punish him, uh, sometimes lethally. <laughs> uh, and, and so the fact that the father doesn't do that and actually gives him uh, his inheritance suggests that the father is not behaving as a good proper patriarch, if you will. And, 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 the, and when we get to the older son, maybe I'll just jump there uh, and we can come back to the life of the son, first son. Uh, but the, father, the older son becomes much more angry uh, that he didn't get this stuff and he's been the good, dutiful son, which also betrays the fact that he expected to get the perks of the patriarchal privilege. And, and the story is critiquing him too, even though we might sympathize with him a bit, especially if we have some privilege, uh, and think that, that yes, he's right to be angry. 
Uh, but I actually think that's part of the point, is that insofar as this parable is like the previous parables about the kingdom of God and, and the ministers of God and, and God up in, the, up in the heavens, the Father is the closest, if we do allegorize a little bit, to standing for God. And the uh, lesson seems to be that God is not the big patriarch in the sky that legitimates patriarchal structures in the world. Rather, God is the non-patriarchal father who is willing to be shamed if it is allowing the people to find their way. And, uh, and rather, it's the, you know, it's the shepherd and the woman who are the sort of examples of that non-patriarchal authority being worked out in ministry in the, in the world. That opens up a depth, I think, that we don't usually get when we hear this um, parable. In fact, we read it so often, we use it at um, reconciliation services. It is something most people can know the storyline, basically. Father Mike, you have preached on this, I am sure, hundreds of times in different settings. What is one aspect of this narrative that you sometimes use and maybe tell us why that motif is something you really stress or emphasize. Like Robert says, it's a break from conventional wisdom. We set us ourselves up in society as um, there are certain things you're supposed to do. You know, the older son gets the inheritance for, for asking, that's a, you know, all of those things. As Robert mentioned before, but this completely breaks out of all conventional wisdom. So when one talks about forgiveness and the whole sense of forgiveness, it's a radical break about somebody forgiving someone who's taken, been taken advantage of, who's thrown himself into a life of disarray, who's had to work with the lowest of all things, feeding swine, and, to feel, and seeing people around him who are le lower than him being fed where he himself doesn't even get that, where his status has changed quite, coming back. And the one thing I always um, emphasize when I preach on this is the father sees the son, and instead of allowing the son to come to him, he gets up and runs towards the son. And he does it with joy, and he does it with an embrace, does not even let the son who's been practicing his lines yeah. to do that. So it, it, it's something that breaks with the conventional wisdom, but even our conventional wisdom today, because we always put conditions on forgiveness. We always say, well, if you want to be forgiven, you've got to do one, two, three, and four. And yet what we see here is simply, then you have the other son who gets angry, jealous, um, and uh, just cannot, why are you celebrating? And as I mentioned to people so often in the pews, is how we are like that. In fact, this came up in a recent homily. It says, um, how we pass judgment on others. If I may repeat a line that was said on an airplane recently, who am I to judge? And Who said that? Uh, somebody in white. And, uh, when, um, and we judge all the time. And so this, this he, not knowing all the facts, and not, it probably would never understand this other son would not understand. And for us, sometimes when we see forgiveness bestowed in the church, outside the church, by people, and it doesn't seem to be a re reason or rhyme to have forgiven someone, that's the kind of thing that's not a part of conventional wisdom. So it breaks, if you will. And so it's, it's very hard for people to, to grasp this because people want retribution. That's why we have such things as death penalties. That's why we have all of these other punishments and, and so on, because justice in our mentality in common society is you must be punished severely for your actions. And here it's the sense of forgiveness. And without even being prompted, put a ring on his finger, sh uh, sandals on his feet, uh, kill the fatted calf and celebrate, without even allowing him to say, Father, I'm sorry for what I did. So it, it really does break it, and it is Luke's way, and it's certainly wonderful when you use this for penance service and so on, but it's hard for people to completely grasp it because it's hard for them to grasp it 
and to be a society that would be able to do that, to be able to forgive unconditionally. And so it's a real challenge, I think, uh, for all of us, even though we talk about forgiveness all the time. All the time. But living it out is not easy. Robert, you're going to get the chance that we don't usually give you. We have time now, about two minutes. Is there a way that you wanted to say whatever you were going to say, but also with the chance of linking together um, little motifs that uh, Luke's been building to something, and now he has these three parables to illustrate this servant leadership type? You want to develop that? Well, I think, you know, if we take Father Mike's point about forgiveness, you know, if, if the community is not constructed by privilege and patronage and, re you know, sort of people who can pay back are the important people, then what is it constituted by? Well, I think forgiveness is a really important one, and the other is, is relationality, that the important thing is that the family was broken because the son was lost, uh, the, the, the sinners are lost, they are put on the outside, and, and and that is what is valuable. The community is, is made up of people in, in community, in, in, a, in a family, and that's, and that's what's really important. And it, it ties back finally all the way to last week with, uh, with uh, the, the leader, the owner, who wanted to tear down the fig tree. And you know, if you tear down the fig tree, and if you haven't really given it the fullest possible chance you can give it, then You've cut it. You've cut something off, and and that's what the father was not willing to do with uh, with the younger son. In conclusion, I, I should say one thing. Um, it's been a joy doing this program in the Gospel of Luke, and especially getting to this parable. It's unique in Luke. I think we all know that the prodigal son, the good Samaritan, only Luke. But what's so important is to know that it's unique and yet it's part of a whole construct. It is not an anomaly. It's not coming in from left field. This is pure Luke. This is compassion poured out. This is forgiveness. This is a blueprint for a different community. This is what we've been talking about the last two weeks. I hope that you'll see this parable in a new way and that will also, all of us, live it. That will follow Father Mike's challenge that it's not enough to just say it, it's easy to say forgiveness, forgiveness. When will we forgive? And as the Pope said, who am I to judge? Let us learn and let us pray with Luke this week. God bless.